There we go. All right. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm just, you know, burning the candle at five different ends. Yeah. You know, yep. so it's typ typical me. Fair enough. Fair enough. So yeah. what, do, what do you do now? Um, from what I read, you did the music. I uh, wrote uh, a couple of songs, produced, I think, probably half of the songs, mm -hmm. if not more. And I also wrote the underscore. What do you do now? Uh, well, I sort of left the music industry for a long time, working up in Silicon Valley, working uh, in sort of some of the cyber intelligence network stuff. Uh, and then I ended up moving back to L.A. and I got sucked back in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so um, currently I have I have two record projects that I'm working on right now and also uh, a show that's probably going to go to Netflix that I wrote, I co-wrote. I'm writing the screenplay and uh, I'm one of the producers on. Nice. That's you super know, so, cool. That's exciting. Yeah, it's gonna be, I, I'm really excited about the Netflix thing. Uh, it's it's a great story uh, based on a book. A novelist in, in England wrote a book. I mean, it's a whole long story of how it all came together, but it's a great story. It's it's, you know, post-apocalyptic sci fi, very dark kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. my, yeah. my favorite. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say it seems like in your realm. Yeah. So uh, but it's it's uh, uh, it's a great story. I've been working with Chris Payne. Uh, and he lives in France. So, you know, we have meetings um, midnight here and it's nine o'clock in the morning for him. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, I want to make sure that our entire storyline, because it's very complex, that it is absolutely not a hair out of place up through the fourth season. Yeah. Because, you know, you sort of watch some of these shows and you go, well, wait a minute. Didn't something mm -hmm. else happen in episode three? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you're going to see something in episode three and then you're going to understand what you saw like which you know sort of didn't really mean like anything at the time but then in mm -hmm. episode eight you're like oh my god wait a minute that yeah. was that guy <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so there's, awesome. there's there's you know and there's a very specific netflix format mm -hmm. right like if you watch all the netflix stuff they all follow the same format yeah so i'm yeah. like okay fine <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, yeah. so uh, but yeah, you know, and then I'm and then I have two music projects that I'm working on. You know, those are it, it's funny. Covid sort of forced everybody to really get their home studio stuff together. Yeah. Right. And so now you all of the like the major, major, major musician like studio musicians, they all have home studios. Mm -hmm. So like I just send them tracks, they record, they send me the tracks back. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like you never actually see anybody in person. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, it looks like you got logic open in the background or maybe that's. Yeah. FL. Oh, I can't no, tell, actually, but... that's that's Luna. Do you know? Oh, Luna? OK. No, I'm not familiar with that one. OK, so UA, you know, UA, like, you know, the Apollo boxes, mm -hmm. the, the IO boxes, Apollo quad and all of that crap. So UA decided to make their own DAW, their own you know, oh. right. So, and if you own any of their hardware, they give you the software for free. Nice. Right. And that's so, legit. Yeah. Yeah. And so being the fact that they make the hardware and the software, so really deep hooks between the two that you're not going to have with different manufacturers. So mm -hmm. you can run their plugins in the hardware, the load off your processor. Right. So nice. all of a sudden, yeah, like yeah. if you're, if you're running Luna and you can run all these plugins in the hardware DSP, then, you, you know, boom, your processor has 80% more resources. Yeah. yeah, it's really, it's really cool. Of course, you have to own their fucking right, the software. <laughs> I mean, their hardware. But I'll tell you what the greatest thing about Luna is. And first of all, so it's really new. It's only like a year and a half, two years old. But I think what the peop what the Luna developers did was they went to like the Logic and the Pro Tools power users and asked them, what do you hate about Logic? What do you hate about Pro Tools? Because right? I certainly have my list of things that I hate. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, that's all I was using was Logic and Pro Tools. They fixed all of it, right? Because Luna is very intuitive, right? In fact, like on Luna, you never save anything. There is no save button. Really? Yeah. yeah it, it, the minute and I've had situations where, you know, I mean, I've been on Luna 
in the early days and you're doing stuff and boom, everything crashes. And you're mm-hmm. like, fuck, how much did I lose? Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. It, it didn't lose a thing. Nice. Lost nothing. So that's, that's that. like, that's sort of their thing is we're going to just take that responsibility away from you. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like when you're done, you just close the thing. Oh, we've already mm-hmm. saved everything. Also the creative flow. Cause mostly I'm a composer, the creative flow in Luna, which is why I have, have went over to it is it's so transparent. Like you can stay in creative mode as opposed to logic where mm-hmm. it's like, Oh yeah, I've got to do this and that, and then that and this, and then you can get back to what you're doing. And it's like, it's like in logic, something that takes four steps or five steps in Luna, it takes one step, right? So that's, that's my pitch for Luna. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> right um, yeah. But you know, I mean, it, it, it's still in its infancy. Yeah. You know, okay. it's like, like, like one of the bad parts about Luna, there's no media manager. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what that means is, so you're your own media manager, better have your fucking shit together. Anything you delete right? Like I'm deleting this track and it's not in archives. I'm just deleting the fuck out of it. It stays, you know, in the main Luna file. Uh So you're dragging around a whole bunch of trash that you can't get rid of. Now there's a workaround that they developed for that, which is not for the faint hearted. Mm -hmm. Like you have to like all the tracks you want to keep, you have to do a particular modification to them so that they get time stamped for right now. And then you go into this file and you delete everything that doesn't have a current timestamp. And you're like, oh, that's, oh, that sounds so safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, they need a media manager. Because I mean, one of the, you know, there's a song, yeah. you know, I, I went to uh, New York a couple of months ago to do uh, uh, horn section stuff. Right. Because, you know, it's like that I, I was so lucky to have uh, Rob Mouncey uh, do mm-hmm. the horn arrangements and he's in New York and all the super, triple chair horn players in new york so much easier for just me to go to new york as opposed to let's bring them all right. out <laughs> yeah. and, and and so that's a lot of tracks yeah right you know because between you know, you got five horns you've got a, a close room mic and a far room mic so that's nine tracks per take and so you know you do three or four takes and you know that's that's a lot of tracks and then you edit it all down and you're just using this and dragging everything else around as dead weight, mm-hmm. right? The file for that song is 19 gig. Oh my God. <laughs> Jeez. Right. Because I have got I have live drums. I have live, you know, I have tons of guitar tracks, keyboard, like live keyboard tracks. It's like all oh, there's a fucking boatload of tracks, right? And yeah. There are 30 tracks of background vocals, right? Wow. You know, and like and stuff so it's like yeah you're but are you you know i'm using like this much right Uh and then here's you know an extra you know 15 gig of shit you're not using yeah and every (laughs) every time it's like hey you know i'm gonna send you this track and it's like you know 19 gig through my google drive right it's like okay well that's gonna take a minute yeah um yeah but so that's you know that's sort of what i'm doing but you know it's sort of the post covid thing and things are sort of coming back to life you know, and then and then they get clamped down on again, depending yeah. on whatever the the latest, you know, COVID thing is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, that, it, everything's moving ahead. It's just, you know, it's like it's it's a whole brave new world out there mm-hmm. now. You know, it's like yeah. live. You mean be in a room with somebody? What do you mean? <laughs> people? 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 Yeah. People? I mean, people are on the screen. They're not yeah. in person. Yeah. <laughs> Well, cool. Well, congratulations on that. I look forward to um, hearing more about that and seeing the, where all yeah, that no, goes for you. Yeah, theoretically, the the one of the albums I'm working on will be hopefully done in about six months. Then uh, it's going to be mixed in New York, um, hopefully by Elliot Shiner. That's sort of who I'm like praying to God. Please, God. <laughs> how do you try to mix this i mean yeah. i've mixed about eight billion records yeah you know yeah. but like i you know i'm the artist now on the album nice. and i would really prefer to like like here get, relinquish get, that to someone else this yes. to somebody who's a fucking god in the- <laughs> <laughs> right 
you yeah. know, as opposed to like, you know, oh yeah, okay, gun to the back of my head, mix the record. Now. I gotta okay. do this. Yeah. <laughs> so it'd be, so that hopefully uh, Elliot Shiner will mix it. Um, yeah. Uh, so and that's a, sort of about where that is. So what did you want to talk about, like in the Rockula zone? So okay, I did not expect to love <laughs> this musical as much as I did. I know, isn't that it, like, strange? There are people it, who just like they see it. Like, this is the greatest movie. There's it's a, just, you know, it, there, it's so endearing. There's a, there's a production company in Texas, right, that produces films and stuff, mm-hmm. and they when they were putting their production company together, one of them had watched Rockula and they decided to call their production company Stanley's Death Art yes. Productions. Uh-huh. I, I saw that. I'm, I thought that was yeah. legit. And I'm like reading this. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> you know? In the music industry, not really in the film industry, but in the music industry, if the music industry actually made something tangible, you know, like tractor parts or something, it wouldn't work. <laughs> right it, like whatever we made it just wouldn't work right yeah. but it's like and the supporting industries like you know like people who make cds actually make you know the cd plant right. make, you know, the flashing plant that makes the vinyl like uh, those are like real industries and their stuff has to work right yeah. <laughs> but like the like music the, you know the stuff that we make which is mm-hmm. basically complex sound waves going through the air which is highly subjective i love that song i hate that song Right. Mm-hmm. So there's there's absolutely no organization to it all. Right. You know, and, and it's like, I don't think I don't know if you know who Clive Davis is. Mm-mm. OK, so Clive Davis at one point, you know, he signed he was the guy who signed Whitney Houston and a bunch of other stuff. And he was like big, big record company guy. And he proved you can take a big scoop of steaming dog shit <laughs> and if you shove it down the throat of the American public hard enough they'll swallow it yeah right? and he <laughs> proved that yeah it was like and everybody in the music industry oh my god clive davis is a god because he proved that you can make people eat dog shit right <laughs> you, know? you know so that, it's like this is the industry i'm in oh this yeah. is fabulous and at yeah. that point i was like i'm i'm gonna find something else interesting to do <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's fair that's fair i guess my first question was just understanding what your original role was for the movie because it was music production is that right right yeah so well, my original role for the movie was to produce songs right whether i was a co-writer or not i was going to be producing songs and to do the underscore and so i ended up writing a song with dean you know we wrote rapula uh, and then I wrote uh, The Night, Tony Basil's song, Tony and Asunlade, who's very young at the time. Uh, he flew in from St. Louis and we like wrote the song in like 20 minutes. Really? <laughs> it was like, brr, yeah, but he's a freaking genius. Yeah. Right. I mean, this this guy was like, oh, this you want what? Bam! <laughs> I'm like, wow, <laughs> I'm impressed. And so he's done very, very well for himself. This was nothing difficult for him at all. And mm-hmm. but the great thing about that song, so I was making a lot of records with Mike Cimbello at the time, right? You know, flash dance and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And, and he's an absolutely brilliant musician and brilliant vocalist and technician, right? And so, you know, we're recording the stuff, and Tony came in and did her vocals. And I got this idea. I was like, hey, some like like crazy sort of doo wops would be really cool. And you know, so that doo wop. You know, so Mike came in, did all those doo-wops and the sort of the background vocally stuff. And he did that in like 10 minutes. Wow. Right. Because we're at his studio. I was like, hey, Mike, can you do this? And he comes in and is like, bam, done, boom. And I'm like, the value of being at Mike's studio. (laughs) (laughs) No kidding. (laughs) You you get shit like that. Yeah. Um, This was sort of almost like, terrorist filmmaking this was like (laughs) filmmaking with no safety net whatsoever yeah because it was there were times where we had no idea what we were doing tomorrow right really you know yeah it was just it was moving so fast now fortunately luca you know very comfortable in that area and jeff i mean they they know how to to sail the pirate ship right Mm -hmm. and we were coming up with things just you know like literally three minutes before we shot it 
you know, oh, wouldn't it be wow. really funny if blah, blah, blah happened? Okay, mm-hmm. let's shoot it. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and then there were times where, like, on uh, By My Side, right? So this mm-hmm. whole thing where Ralph gets hit by the car, things are going to go a lot faster if somebody who knows the song really well is the playback operator. Right. Mm-hmm. So you cue it right to where it needs to be. You shoot that sequence, you shoot that sequence. Right. And so it ended up being a situation where there were several times where I needed to be the playback operator. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, I'm sitting there like playing all the stuff back on the set and I'm like, wow. Oh my God. I'm this is, I, you know, have I stooped this low? I guess I have. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the reality is you do. You do whatever you need to do to get the the shot done. There were a lot of things that were just completely ad lib. Like even the cameras are rolling and we think we know what we're going to shoot and something else happens. Oh, no, that was great. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of I mean, I can point out all the little funny things that happened that we weren't expecting. Yeah. But it all was just sort of seamless. Mm hmm. You know, so that that worked out really well. And my job basically was to sort of oversee the rest of the songs that were being cut, mix stuff, do the underscore, uh, write in anything that parts that were, you know, were missing or they decided they want different music or something. Uh, So, yeah, it was, you know, sometimes it's like I write and record something and it's being shot tomorrow. Wow, that's (laughs) intense. Yeah, you said your role changed a lot during that what was like the most unexpected thing you found yourself doing boy that's a good question all of it (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah what was like what was the vibe like on the set of rockula because like watching it i get the I, i get the idea that everyone there was like we're doing this we're all in we're committing to this like right the energy like yeah so it's you know it's a hundred percent commitment to theater of the absurd. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you can't try, you have to be yeah. right. Because you try, you can't try to be funny. You have to be funny. Mm-hmm. Right. The set was, was very focused. You know, it would seem chaotic from the fringes, but it wasn't right. And we had just the most freaking brilliant people, Pamela Scase Levy, who to me, made that all work because the costume stuff was brilliant right it was brilliant i mean it wasn't overstated it was it was just like it just it added the flavor Mm -hmm. right and she was on point she you know always there because you never know what's going to change like this isn't like a big budget thing where you know exactly what you're going to shoot today right it's right. like, well, we were going to shoot this, but we're going to drive across town and shoot something else first. Yeah. <laughs> the set, I think, overall was pretty smooth. You know, the set construction was very complex, yeah. right? Because you have these razor thin walls, right, to do the mirror joke. So they, not only do they have to make the reflection room and everything's backwards, mm-hmm. right? But that wall has to be so thin that it looks like it's a mirror. I, You know, the... <laughs> funniest stuff so obviously as a filmmaker you're going to want to do the thing where you have a contiguous shot where you start on ralph and you move and stuff and then there's the thing so there's no edit point right but what did get edited out is the sound of dean running around the set to get on the (laughs) other right the side of it yeah you know so he could be on this side and then you know and then we do some oh this what's that over there oh wait a minute back then he's already in frame all of that, you know, I mean, we built these sets, we, they built these sets, you know, in a freaking warehouse in downtown LA. We shot everything pretty much in downtown LA and, and just like, you know, setting up and, and, and just going and, and, you know, or there was some stuff, we did some stuff on Ventura Boulevard and there was Ralph and Mona's house, but that was not far from downtown. Everybody was very into it and everybody was focused. That's how you end up being able to make something like that. So for me, it was different because I'm not on set all the time. I'm dealing with, you know, pre-production, production, production, post-production stuff. There are a lot of people outside of the production that I'm having to deal with, right? Like either the mixers or Canon this or whatever. And I mean, some of the people at Canon were like, they did not understand 
what we were doing. Right. Yeah. They just like they didn't. I mean, the funniest part was, I mean, you've heard the whole story. You know, Luca and Jeff present this script, Rockula, to, to Menachem, right? The head mm -hmm. of Canon Films. And he doesn't read the script. He green lights it. He's like, the name alone is worth a million dollars. Make the film. And everyone's like going, what? Right. It was that easy? It was, yeah. But so here's the part. It gets even funnier. So we're in pre-production, right? All of a sudden, it's a scramble. Like, we're what? We're, we're in pre-production now? <laughs> right? Yeah. So Canon gives us a floor of one of their buildings, right? That's going to be mm -hmm. our offices. And everybody's moving in and crewing up and staffing up. And Luca and Jeff are in, like, nightmare casting land, Right. Um, yeah. and the rest of Canon, like, like in normal circumstances, like this film has a green light and all the departments get a script. Right. Mm -hmm. So in this situation is the film got a green light. Nobody knows about that except accounting and nobody got a script. Right. And wow. so, so like after, you know, we're, we're in pre-production by a couple of weeks and, and, and so people are from other departments are coming by going, um, I, you guys are in production, right? You know, we don't, no one ever gave us a script. <laughs> and we're like, what? <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, sure. And then, yeah. you know, and then they would read it and go, we're making this? <laughs> you know, you know yeah. I mean, you know, you get these reactions from people going, I, I kind of don't understand this script. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all I could do is tell them, you weren't meant to understand it. You know, I said, this is script for kids, right? So they'll understand it. Those are the people who, you know, are going to see this show. You know, that was the interesting part was like sort of the people who got it and the people who didn't get it, mm -hmm. you know, because they're, yeah. they're so used to like, you know, whether we make movies starring John Voight about a train, right? <laughs> That's all we do. <laughs> yeah know? yeah um and so they didn't quite get it but that's okay i mean i'll tell you the one thing i mean my regrets about the thing is that i didn't keep masters right because like an idiot because i've done a lot of films right and film companies always take care of their masters mm -hmm. except the problem is is that when we finished rockula the canon film you know library went bounced from different owner to different owner to different owner and all those tapes got lost not only did all those tapes get lost but there were like two or three scenes that they cut out of rockula just for time purposes mm -hmm. and two of those scenes i was absolutely livid about i was like how can you cut this scene out how can you do it not only is it a brilliant scene but it so contributes to the movement of the storyline. There's a fantastic scene where it's a dream that Ralph has that he's on trial and, and there's the jury of his peers, right? And the jury of his peers are like Frankenstein and Dracula, <laughs> and, you know, right? And yeah. it's so funny. It was a brilliant scene. Nobody ever saw it. Got cut out. Wow. There was that one, and then there was the music box, and then Thomas Dolby scene, right? Right. Okay. So right. was the music box explaining why that mattered? <laughs> well, so you remember in the scene at the graveyard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so it's got all when Ralph says, and... right. So, so when Ralph says, you know, you remember this? You said you did back at the house. Yeah, there was a scene back at the house, right? That we shot that I thought was like really integral to to supporting the storyline. And they go, and that's out. Right. And so I was like, oh, God. And decisions, you know, being made by like 60 year old executives who have no business opening their stupid mouths about shit like this, <laughs> you know, which is just yeah. like, I, I, you know, I have a zero tolerance for that shit. My brother is much more diplomatic. I just wanted to knock that guy's teeth out. <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, you know, I mean, yeah. there was a there was a meeting with Menachem about this was like way, way into post production. They're going to start making posters for the film, and Menachem was like, "I found a poster where he's biting the guitar." And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so 
like how bad could it actually be if I grabbed him and dragged him across his desk and explained to him that we're not making this film for 65 year old people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, okay, well, no, okay. I won't do that. Um, Mm -hmm. But you know, there was, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you've put so much work in, you know, they're not paying you very much. Like I've, I've worked on plenty of projects where, you know, big 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 budgets right it's all professionals and nobody's doing anything stupid right and it's always the small budget stuff where you have to deal with idiots you know i mean i have so many examples of that but overall you know yeah it 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 was sad that it didn't really get a release right and that we couldn't really release a soundtrack for me you know in in the early early days before i really like right when they got when Jeff and Luca are still sort of reeling from the, we have a green light. <laughs> what? And so, you know, we had this discussion where they said, so one of two things is going to happen. Either Luca's is going to get the short end of the stick or I'm going to get the short end of the stick because you're either going to hire actors who can sing or singers who can act. And one of us is going to get the short end of the stick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, cause I'm thinking, Oh God, this, Oh, this is, you know, So I have all my vocal coaches lined up and, you know, I'm ready for like, you know, okay, Millie Vanilli, bring them on. I'll, (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, but no, but we got really lucky. I mean, we got Tawny, who's obviously a great singer and Mm -hmm. Dean, who's a great singer and they're both great actors. Right. Mm -hmm. So we got really, really, really lucky, you know, because it's like, I'm not going to mention some of the other people who are being considered. They're like pretty, some pretty big people. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I was like, going, no, 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 not them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, so so that ended up working out great, you know, but it was definitely, you know, when you're in the when you're in it, you know, contemporaneously, you know, and you're sitting there like going, God, this this could really be a nightmare. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, uh, they're going to oh, we love this actor, but he can't sing to save his freaking life. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, oh. God, you know, um, but no, we were lucky. We were really, we were lucky. And it's so funny that this film that we made 700 years ago just took on a life of its own, you know, which was like so odd. You yeah. know, it's like this, I, you, you don't see it coming. I was curious how you felt. I mean, if you expected it to do well at the <laughs> box office, if you expected people would still be talking about it, you know, 30 years but later. You don't, you, you, yeah, I mean, you don't even think 20 years later. I mean, you hope it'll do well at the box office, which means it'll do well. You know, it'll have a position in a soundtrack situation. I, you know, I was being realistic with myself because I've done I've done a lot of pop records, pop R&B records. And so, yeah, you know, they do really great. And then two years later, that it's over. Right. Yeah. I've also done records that have made money for me for the last like 35 years where it's like, they just don't stop playing that record, which Mm -hmm. is just weird. Right. (laughs) Um, You know, you, yeah, you have your, your, your short term goals. Like I really Mm -hmm. hope that, you know, this can, can do some box office, you know, stuff. And you never really think about the future. I mean, who could predict necessarily the internet? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because that's really what, that was the tool that allowed the sort of rockula subculture to, to exist, mm-hmm. you know, so wasn't thinking about that. Yeah. Like one day people will have computers and watch rockula. Right? You know, <laughs> so, you know right. it's, it's not something that you think about, but um, it is really interesting as far as like the fact that so many people and so many reviews you know, and like you, you know, they, there's something that spoke to them and it's not something necessarily that any of us who are deeply involved in the making of Rockula, we don't, my memories of Rockula are a freaking shitload of work, yeah. right? It was like a boatload of insane work in a very condensed amount of time for not very much money, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's sort of, you know, it's like when I'm watching Rockula, it's like, oh, here that scene. And in the back of your head is like, yeah, you had to do this, 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 that. And then that session and this, you know, it's like all this like noise in the back of your head mm-hmm. about everything you went through to make that work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I always wondered what would it 
what would it be like to watch Rockula without any of that in your head? Yeah. You know, clearly people really like it, you know? So, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's people out there who go that, well, yeah, I mean, there's reviewers who said, that's the worst movie I've ever seen. And I'm yeah. like, okay, that's cool. What's the best movie you've ever seen? Right. Yeah. You know? <laughs> It was it was definitely an interesting time. It was it was a pivotal time musically and and cinematographically. Mm -hmm. Like everything, you know, we didn't have CGI, right? We did we couldn't make weird shit. Everything we shot was exactly what we shot. It, it's like you have to be really creative, especially when you have no money to shoot it with. Mm -hmm. You know, so that part that part was interesting. That was a challenge. I mean, I've worked on really big budget stuff and you know wow yeah it's great that we just spent a million dollars filming this one scene right yeah and you're like you know oh great because people have lots of money okay yeah. you know <laughs> um, but you know it's like hey we're gonna spend a million dollars making the whole freaking movie yeah <laughs> yeah you what know. was the budget for it do you remember I think it, was, yeah, it was like a million dollars yeah you know, okay. and, and that's like all in. That's like above the line, below the line, the whole deal. You know, all this silliness that they talk about. Y'all, I made this film for $10,000. Well, either it looks like that or or you didn't actually make that film for $10,000. Yeah, you yeah. Know? There's a lot, a lot. Yeah. I was just going to go into um, the soundtrack itself right. because you worked your magic on the bootleg and i was really curious how the hell you managed to do that well i didn't so i was at our storage place because i was actually looking for something for luca mm -hmm. right and because you know he's in in cutter right so he's not exactly close to los angeles so i found a cassette and it had all the song titles. I'm like, oh my God, right? Here's a cassette that's, so my storage is in, I don't know, you don't know the California area, but so my storage is in Palmdale. And Palmdale is the high desert, right? And the temperatures in the high desert routinely in the summer get to like 130. So this cassette has been sitting up there for like a decade being roasted, right? Wow. So I'm like looking at this cassette going, okay, there is one guy in Hollywood, okay, who could possibly do this. And so I happen to know him, and he has this whole studio of stuff that he, you know, he is the master of reclaiming tapes that normally would be freaking dead. Yeah. Right. And so. I had a meeting with him and he was like, and, and it's like the patient, it's like, we're, we're in the morgue and, <laughs> and there's a cassette on the table and we're both looking at it and he, you know, and he's, and, and I told him the background and he's like, okay. And so he just takes like a little thing and he sort of sees if the tape is loose. And of course it's not right. So I'm like, Oh, this is getting worse by the minute. <laughs> right? He goes, this is a point of no return thing. We're just going to go all hands on deck on this to see if we can actually get this tape across the heads one time. And so he very carefully pulled the tape out of the tape, the plastic tape mechanism and put it in a thing that he built, right? That where the tape would fit in, right? And that could play in a tape player it was like all made out of metal and then he baked it right in this special oven that's for baking tapes which is a normal thing like mm -hmm. if you have a really old tape you bake it and it loosens up the glue and sort of reattaches the oxides right so you can at least get it across the heads once before everything falls into dust but this wasn't going to work right because this tape is already stuck together but we're gonna we're gonna bake it and then he's going to freeze it in nitrogen after that, right? Which theoretically will pop the tape apart. The tapes will stop sticking to the back, right? And th that was his theory. He's like, this has worked in the past, right? Yeah. I've, never, I've never done it on a cassette. And he goes, and as soon as it gets to room temperature, I have everything set up and in record and we hit the play button and whatever we get, we get. And he got the whole thing. You know, and that's how we got that. And then so 
needless to say, you know, it's a hundred thousand year old cassette and I don't even know what mixes they were using. And some of them were temp mixes and there's all kinds of shit and mastering engineers. So I put it through a lot of really great plugins, right? <laughs> you know, and got it up to a level of like, okay, that's acceptable. It's mm-hmm. better than nothing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then that's how we have, what we have and it wasn't complete and most of the takes were good but uh, on for some reason on some of the songs there was still either some foley or you know whatever set noise you know in other words they had like stuff that they were dubbing in for the mix Mm -hmm. right so i had to edit that out and replace it with something Mm -hmm. right so like i could do stuff where i could edit that out i could take another piece of music strip the vocal out of that and put that in you know to sort of bridge it so there was like there's fixes here and there but overall you know i mean it's it's the soundtrack it was just one of those okay we sort of here's kind of a soundtrack okay Uh, (laughs) yeah yeah because i I thought it sounded it sounded really good when i listened to it it, so i was really impressed that it survived all of that yeah it did and it and the funniest part is sort of in engineering world there's sort of in the old days there were sort of two groups of people there were the neve console people and the ssl console people right and i was a neve person like i love recording and mixing on neve consoles and there, there are other people um and i've done plenty of records on ssls when the client wants them it's like okay fine and so ssl was the big you know any pop record hit has been recorded on an ssl ssl has a stereo bus compressor which is called the ssl sound okay that's what everyone when everyone says oh it's the ssl sound it's because they have a fucking compressor on the stereo bus and so there's a plug-in now there's the ssl stereo bus compressor plug-in and I sort of look at it with my nose up going, mm-hmm. yeah, sure. Fine. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, for some reason I was like, well, let me see what it makes the mixes sound like. And I'm like, Oh my God. Okay. I'm running all of this through the SSL. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah. there you go. You know, I've been holding my nose up against that stuff and then I end up using it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Who is, Dr. Daddio, because Dr. I can't Daddio. find anything. <laughs> oh, uh, his name is uh, Mark. Is it Mark uh, David Decker? Yeah. Is that who that also is? Yeah. Oh, so why did he, he's on I, the written I, and produced part. Was yeah, well, he, he trying wrote, to he, do a music career or like? I, I don't know, but it was like he wrote the opening title track, right? Yeah. That's what he, that's the song that he, I'm. I have that it's uh, Rockula, Hey Mona, and Club Hell are listed as being performed by him. Oh, oh, that's right. Hey Mona. Oh, Mm -hmm. I forgot about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Hey Mona. And then I don't know what the Club Hell theme would be. Um, But yeah, no, his stuff was great. Mm -hmm. His stuff was awesome. Um, And yeah, I don't I don't really know. Never met him. Never talked to him. Luca was like, hey, look, we've got these tracks. And I'm like, I listened to them. I said, let's use them. You know, there was the whole um, animated, you know, cr- front mm-hmm. credits thing. You know, it's one of the things that we talked about was shooting a sequel to Rockula. Mm-hmm. You know, and so thinking, what on earth would that look like? Um, and the only example, I don't, I don't know that you've ever seen this film, but, uh, you know, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor a film called who's afraid of virginia wolf Mm -hmm. right and it's really really dark it's like really depressing dark and i was like we need to make a comedy version of that (laughs) you know it's like yeah you model the sequel on because so because it gives you the you know it's like now now you know mona and ralph are at loggerheads with each other yeah kind of thing it's like that then you know good tension yeah. You know, a film where everything's fine, nobody wants to see that, right? Right, right. Um, but uh, that would that would be funny. I would like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Maybe one day. The you know the 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 whole sort of genre of you know there there were well there really wasn't a genre of what we were doing. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like you couldn't really put Rockula. Oh, it's this kind of film. <laughs> it's like no, it's it's not. It's actually a crazy film that you know, theoretically, it's hard to define. I'm, I've, I've been trying to tell people about 
how I'm learning about this. And like, oh, what's it like? And I'm like, I can't, you just have to watch it. I can't tell yeah, it, you, I can't it, summarize it, that. It sort of defies description. Yeah. You know, um, he's a vampire who hasn't been laid in 400 years. And right, you know, yeah, <laughs> and it's like, you're like, why, what? <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. so yeah, I mean, even the descriptions and in, in the the you know the little uh, ad things, it just mm-hmm. makes me cringe. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just, it's so much more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Bo Diddley. Oh, the most awesome person on the planet. He was a wonderful person to be around. He so naturally just went right into the theater of the absurd effortlessly. Mm-hmm. Like some people took a little squeezing to get them in. He, he was like, boom, he's in. One day he, he like did this whole barbecue thing that he cooked for the crew. It was great. He was wonderful. He was like a wonderful person. Yeah. And he was just there to be his part. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, whatever Pamela gave him to wear, you know, that's boom, <laughs> put it on. And you look at yeah. some of the stuff that he, you know, and you're like going, wow, that's a trooper. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious because, like, he, he seemed so there for the film. And, like, he was just, I mean, like, like you said, he, he wore the spandex, like, he went all in. So I was curious, like, did you try to get him to be more on the music side of things? Or was that, like, not in the budget? He, it wasn't really his kind of music. Yeah. Right. So, so our sort of approach was n- not quite. Um, I mean, we were sort of. This was like late '80s pop is sort of what we were doing, and it's and and we weren't necessarily like making fun of it, right? But it was we. The goal was contemporary late '80s pop, mm-hmm. right? Which is essentially, you know, for the most part, what you have. I mean. Sure. You know, there's some tracks that are very tongue in cheek, like Rapula or something like that. And, you know, the little high voices and low voice on yeah. Rapula. Are you the DJ? No, I'm the vampire. <laughs> I said I'm the vampire. <laughs> that those are both me. <laughs> oh, my God. OK. Right. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we did that like in a day. Like we yeah. wrote it and recorded it and just, you know, and just thought, okay, you know, we're going to have these disembodied voices on it, which some people didn't quite understand. They're like, well, where are those voices coming from? And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's, you stop thinking so hard about it. Just <laughs> yeah. Be there for it. Exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, Bo did, and even, you know, Kevin Hunter, you know, the guy who plays the drunk, right? Mm-hmm. So he's from Wire Train right at the time so that that was a great band but they were not really in that genre Mm -hmm. right so luca and jeff sort of had their their view of where the musical aspect of the film sits and so it it, which was interesting for me you know not only being writing and producing tracks you know like by my side and and all of those you know tracks mm-hmm. but i'm writing the score so this isn't west side story right so <laughs> like west side story you've got these brilliant orchestrations i mean the music for west side story in my opinion some of the greatest music ever written ever it was all organic and contiguous it was the same orchestra pretty mm-hmm. much right and so underscore would seamlessly blend into a song, right? Not going to happen in Rockula, right? <laughs> That's just yeah. not going to happen. So I was like, I'm messing around with ideas and stuff. I'm like, okay, I don't want to be overbearing, right? I don't want to like do the overbearing score like Lady Hawk or something where mm-hmm. they had Toto do a bunch of songs. And <laughs> of course, Toto is all absolutely brilliant musicians, but like having a rock background thing was like okay that's kind of overkill and so i opted sort of for the fairy dust approach like the score is light and fairy dusty and it's just there for wisps to connect the next you know this song to the next song Mm -hmm. you know so you know the only time i ever got into anything that was like score score was like the fight scene at the end Mm-hmm. Right where where Dolby, you know, and Ralph are, are fencing, and so I'm going for like the old fashioned 
swashbuckler the music goes along with the strikes thing you know but mm-hmm. it but it's a comedy and i don't have the money for an orchestra so <laughs> you know it's going to be kind of comedic stuff and then of course i have to sort of seamlessly go into the you know the the part where you know oh do you forgive me of course mom right mm-hmm. oh, no, everything's fine right <laughs> So, you know, you have to like, okay, I'm, this is going to, this whole scene has to be constructed, you know, in a particular way. So there were some challenges, other films that I've scored, uh, where like the entire film is like chase scenes and bar fights, right? Mm-hmm. So real easy, just chase scenes and bar fights, right? Yeah. But Rocky <laughs> was like, you know, like the scene where, you know, Ralph leaves the little flyer in Mona's door about, you know, Rockula playing, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and then it zooms back and we see Stanley. So we have to go from, oh, it's love thing and the, and uh oh, it's Stanley. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You know, but you can't, you know, you, you it's, it's not going to be villainous music, right? It has to be just sort of, you know, slightly hinting at, oh, this might be a problem. It was a, somewhat of a challenge to find what I consider to be the right footing. Yeah, because I, I like the music and I love Break These Chains. I love By My Side. I love The Night. All of these you had your hands on. So why did you and Dean write Rapula? <laughs> why did you do this? <laughs> but because because it was, so again, right, it was an open palette. It wasn't in the script. It was like song, right? They were going to have a song. And so, oh, so you, know, you just had to come up with anything. Well, it was, I, I think scene, that's what Dean, I, I think Dean came up with the title Rapula and he <laughs> wrote the lyrics and I wrote and played all the music and did the voices. You're pushing the envelope. You, you don't have a parachute. You're just doing, but yeah, Rapula. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, um, and his lyrics were funny. His lyrics yeah. <laughs> were, they were very funny. And then the weird voices like, you know, oh, what a weird guy, right? You know, and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so you, you're you in theater of the absurd. Mm-hmm. So nothing is impossible. Yeah. You know, it's so funny. That's actually been a track that some people love that track. Some people hate that track. So By My Side and Break These Chains, written by David Aronson and Vinnie Screma. So super 80s pop. You know, I didn't play guitar on that, but I played everything else. If you are a big fan of super 80s pop, yeah, you're going to love those songs, mm-hmm. right? You know, it's all about people's taste. Some people, yeah. you know, there's songs they like, songs they don't like. But yeah, Rapula was just, it was, and, and again, so it's like one of those things, write this, I mean, we're already in production, right? Yeah. And we're writing the song, record the song, send the song so everybody can hear it. And then, you know, Pamela's got to hear it. So she can come up with all those outfits, which were, of course, brilliant, yeah. right? Yeah, so nothing's planned. There wasn't yeah. like in the script. And then they sing a song called Rapula, right? Mm-hmm. There was nothing in the script. So okay. that that's sort of part of how that stuff happens. And sometimes it works for everybody. Sometimes it only works for some people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was so like, I remember watching that scene and just wanting to understand what how 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 <laughs> like how yeah. that all Listen, came together <laughs> we we would like to know that ourselves yeah <laughs> we're like yeah. oh my god i did that i did that <laughs> <laughs> you sure that wasn't somebody else yeah. um but yeah no it's just it was you're just working at a really fast pace mm-hmm. you know working in the music industry in the areas that i work in which is you know I've engineered and mixed a boatload of records, written, played on a lot of records, produced records, whatever. So you have to be creative in a very high pressure environment. The label's paying you a lot of money to be creative. And so a lot of pressure, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, really the pressure during Rockula was the time constraints. Mm -hmm. We had no time to do anything. You know, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, we're in pre-production for eight months. Right. Yeah. No. no. What was the the timeline? Of uh, for production? Mm-hmm. Oh, God. We I think we we may have been in pre-production for a couple of months. Production was a month. Maybe we shot it in a month. Yeah. This is high mm-hmm. speed. No safety net filmmaking. Yeah. This is like 
shooting stuff as fast as you possibly can and rushing to the next set and shooting that, yeah. you know, I mean, it was like, yeah, I mean, normally you'd want like three months to shoot stuff. You know, we didn't have it. We didn't have time. We didn't have the budget. We didn't have time. And it was just like, okay. And it worked. But Luke yes. has done that on m m several occasions. So it wasn't new to him. He knew how to do it. I mean, you know, he had, he had done, uh, you know, Ghoulies, right? Mm -hmm. And that was made for less than a million dollars. Yeah. You know, but it was, you know, and he was very clever. Him and Jeff wrote it. So they pretty much only had to shoot at one house. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it makes it a lot easier. I mean, even I remember they used for, for whatever the insert car stuff that they shot, they used my uh, Jeep, right? <laughs> because... Well, because I had I had built these like Mad Max bumpers on my Jeep. They were basic like like I beams. Yeah. Right. It's like <laughs> you want to crash into my car? Cut. Come on. Right. Crash into my car. <laughs> right. But the great part about it is that you could clamp lights and cameras and drill holes in it and whatever, you know, anything you want. Right. So yeah. like it was made for an insert car. Yeah. Uh, and I just put that stuff on there just because, you know, sure, you want to, you want to, because I got rear ended in it once and fixing, it was like, oh my God, it's like so much money to fix. And I took it out to a friend of mine who had a body shop out in uh, San Bernardino. And he was like, let's just weld an I beam there. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> right. And then I got rear ended again. And, and, and the, you know, and I'm watching it in my rear view mirror. I'm like, this guy's not going to stop. He's not going to stop. And then bam. Right. So my car moves a little bit. So it was, it was Jeep Cherokee back in the time. So that was a big car back then. This guy had like a Continental Mark IV. It's like the big grill. And it completely destroyed his car. Yeah. And like, I just sort of dusted off my I-beam. I'm like, sorry, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good. Right. And I, yeah. I actually... I got a letter from his insurance company saying that they wanted to charge me for the damage to his car because I had an I-beam for a bumper, right? And I'm like, really? Do you want me to come down there and talk to you about this? And they're like, right. no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, duly noted. Maybe I need to get me an I-beam for my my Hyundai. Well, yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the only problem. So, so this is this was a really. So I don't know if you remember the Jeep Cherokees from like the seventies and eighties. Yeah. Like they were big, big right? Yeah. Because those I beams weighed three hundred and fifty pounds each. Yeah. Right, and so yeah. we, you know, and so you know, we were like going, you know, ah, so what's this going to do to my suspension? We actually chained them on there to see what my car would do before we actually welded them on. Mm -hmm. And the car didn't seem to mind. So, okay, well, anyway, that was sort of an offshoot thing. Yeah. But um, I don't know how much of any other Lucas sort of horror film stuff that you've made, but he's made some really clever stuff. Sort of same thing. You know, the, did, you, did you see the granny? No, I haven't seen um, any of his stuff yet, but I know he's done a lot of things, but I have not heard of the granny. Yeah, it was a film that he wrote and directed with Stella Stevens as the granny. You know, it's like another horror movie thing. And, and you know, and same thing. It's like super high speed filmmaking, you know, just shoot the thing as fast as humanly possible. And, you know, and he's 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 done really well. I mean, fortunately now, you know, I mean, he doesn't have to worry about that now. I mean, he's working. He's in the big time now. So, <laughs> you know, so he doesn't have to worry about, oh, we we only have a million dollars to make a film <laughs> like <laughs> uh, don't worry about that anymore the film business was very tumultuous back then and it went through a lot of different changes i think the film industry has fared much better than the music industry the music industry has been pretty destroyed you know like spotify and all of that stuff it pretty much destroyed the music industry yeah you know, so um, I'm sort of getting back into what I'm doing right now in the music industry because I've made eight billion records for other people. And now I'm going to make a record for me. You know, I'm not concerned about how many records I'm selling. You know, I'm I'm going to make the record that I want to make. So, um, you know, that's sort of why I'm getting back into it. Other than that, you know, I'm working on other stuff. That's awesome. Are there any social media things or anywhere people can find what you're doing online? No, I'm the most anti-social media person you've ever met. <laughs> you know, 
It's like, you know, when I was in San Francisco, fairly high up in these big tech companies, and I absolutely refused to have a LinkedIn page. <laughs> like, I don't blame you. <laughs> you know, but it's like every executive in Silicon Valley is on LinkedIn. I'm like, no, I'm on linked out. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I am not doing that. I'm not interested in that shit. And I used to get a lot of flack about that, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sort of not really, I mean, to me, social media is about making my crazy sort of, uh, you know, political views, you know, I'm like the most anti-Republican person in the universe. Right. And other than that, okay. you know, okay. I was like, <laughs> you know, okay, okay. All right. yeah, you know, but yeah, so it's like, you know, I, I have my particular political viewpoints. So I'll, I'll be very vocal about that, but I don't tell anybody what I'm actually working on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, fair enough. I just, I wanted to, I don't have much of a following. I don't have much of anything, but I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate Not your insight. And I want a way to like do something, you know, plug what you're doing, plug, you know, oh, well, uh, what listen, you got going me, on. I will, uh, the, I will give you the, you know, you'll be the first person, okay. right? When I have something coming out, you'll hear about it before anybody else. Hit me up. Please you know? do. <laughs> and they'll all go, how did you know that? Uh, Right. Well, <laughs> I got the I'm insider talking. knowledge. Yeah, here's a little bit of insider knowledge. So the, the album that I'm doing right now, one of the albums I'm doing right now, it has all of the same musicians, all the very, very top chair musicians that played on all the Steely Dan records. So it's all of those cats wow. are playing on my record. That's legit. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, which is why sometimes you have to go to New York. <laughs> right? yeah, because yeah, they're, yeah because they're not going to come out here um right. so i've been really really lucky to work with these people and their their contributions have been jaw-dropping mm -hmm. just absolutely jaw-dropping like when you get to work with people of that caliber holy crap because uh, all the demos i played all the instruments on all the demos right yeah. and then and then you get to hear what they play and you're like well, that's what it's supposed to sound like. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. You know, yeah. so that's really cool. So, you know, getting to work with cats like that who really like what they're doing, that's been great. And as soon as I can tell you about that project, I will. But, you know, I unfortunately, we all have guns to the back of our heads, you know, yeah. where it's like, you know, I actually had to have a friend of mine put together a website, which he's doing right now, where I can, and I can do this for you when, when it's done, I can send somebody an invite, mm -hmm. right. And they can log in and click on it and it will play the song for them once. Ooh. And that's it. Yeah. Right. So they want to hear the song. Okay. You can hear it once and you don't get a copy. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> you know, cause I'm not going to let this shit get out into the wild. Right. Not until you know, it's, it is yeah. time. Yeah. Right. Well, it's also because, you know, I mean, people, you know, a lot of people agree this would spread like wildfire. Yeah. And that would not be cool. So I'm keeping a really tight leash on it. That's fair. Yeah. You know, um, so but as soon as that website gets up, which hopefully will be soon, uh, I'll send you some links so you can hear what we're doing. I would be honored. You know? I would love to check that out. Yeah. yeah we're, on a personal level. Yeah, yeah, you'd like it. It's it's if you like Steely Dan, you'll love this stuff. Can I share you talking about the tidbit that it has the Steely Dan people sure. in it at all? Because I want to I want to give people a little and a little idea, but I don't want to. Yeah, no, I mean, any, absolutely. You know? you know, it's it's yeah, it's like some of the major major cats who played on Asia and Gaucho and The Nightfly and albums like that. So you don't get to play on those albums unless you're pretty much the top of the top of the top. Yeah. Um, and, and they don't disappoint when they play your stuff and you go, that's why they were on those albums. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, 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 it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I went to Berkeley college of music film score major, and I attended mm -hmm. the program at UCLA film scoring. So I've taken a musical education about as far as you can take it, yeah. you know, and sort of then like after that, I was like, and pop music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I was like, wow, yeah. I didn't see that coming. 
Um, yeah. But, you know, I mean, I for a while I kept my hand and I would score a film here and there, but it just wasn't something that was screaming out to me. Mm-hmm. You want to score films? You know, it's like I would I'd score a film like every three years because it would take me that long to forget how much I hated the last job. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so yeah, but yeah, no, you anything that that we talked about here, you can talk about, it's not a problem. Okay, cool. I appreciate okay. it. Is there anything else you want to add at all to uh, the, your thoughts or yeah? The, no, I mean it's just it's an ongoing thing, and we can have ongoing conversations. I'm I'm curious as to uh, where what they because I just have this feeling that Rocky was not over, no, right? Not. You know, and and yeah. it's like. And part of me is like, well, that's interesting. And another part of me is like, really? <laughs> am I <laughs> am I handcuffed to this movie for the rest of my life? Um, <laughs> but you know, I think I, you know, I think there's legs in there for a sequel, for a Broadway show, for Lord only knows what. Yeah. You know, so and and you'll hear about it before anybody. <laughs> I appreciate I appreciate it. <laughs> Not I a look problem. forward to the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. Sort of, kind of, yeah. <laughs> kind of trepidation, but looking forward to it. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I'm fine. It's just a matter of like, you know, how, you know, like how much I get dragged into it, you know. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it'll be, which is not necessarily bad, but it's like one of those things where, you know, I'm in the middle of this incredible record, and they're like, yeah, but Rockula. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but my magnum opus, this this incredible record I'm working on and I'm waiting my whole career to yeah. make. Yeah, I'm on yeah. tour, but Rockula. Um, <laughs> yeah, really. Well, yeah, no, it's been great to talk to you. Great to meet you. Yeah, uh, and you too. and I will keep you updated as as things get more interesting. All right, sounds good. Okay. Thank you so much, Dale. I appreciate right. it. No problem. All right, talk to you soon. <laughs> See you. All right, bye. bye.